Hello there! It is me again, Jana from the future. When you look at when we recorded this. Anyways, I'm coming to you for the last time. This is part 3 of our thorough and honest analysis of The Legend of Vox Machina Cartoon Season 1. This time we go over episodes 10 to 12 and then address all those things we said we were going to address later in the end. Now, keep in mind that we recorded this episode in May. Long before we knew that there'd be a new season the literal next year. Which is kind of why we don't really have a conclusion for this, a final thesis statement or anything with a similar amount of closure to it, because we figured that'd be time. As it is now, we'll try and scramble and have something ready before the next season drops literally a month from when I'm recording this. So probably as the first thing we'll publish next year. As always, the entire episode without me interrupting can be found on our Patreon. There you will also find notes with the ratings we refer to and can support us for other neat perks. Thank you for listening to this final and most positive part of it all. Have a happy end of the year season of whatever holidays you may or may not celebrate. Ein guten Rutsch, as my people say, and a happy new year. We'll return with more content around mid to late January. Love you all. Enjoy our gushing. of deceit depths of deceit the mm-hmm. depths of deceit i feel like the, the more i say that the more i'm going to sound like the the priest from uh the princess bride <laughs> marriage marriage is what brings us together not yet okay do you want to read it out sure hello episode 10 after a flashback of Ripley torturing Percy, Cass for some reason pleads for her keeping her alive, and they take her along under the castle where she proceeds to do the jobs as a rogue does. They fight dead ancestors together and then get trapped in acid. Cassandra and Vax turn on them and are basically charmed. This is where it got so dark I didn't take notes anymore, so it's very short, but this is what happens. Grok gets them out of the acid and... Bam. Bam. It's mostly just like... Yeah. I mean, like, we, as, as you've met, put here in the notes, like, there are moments where I, which are actually improved upon from the original stream, uh, such as the ancestors. Yeah. yeah. The ancestors of the original stream was a horrible encounter that really dragged the episode down and just existed because Matt wanted to get more spell slots out of them. Although I do kind of wish that they had taken the line from um, the Banshee fight. You remember the Banshee fight? Mm, vaguely. Which one of my ancestors did you just shame to death again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would have been a good one. That would have been a good one have, here. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I, th- I always think that, like, that that was a wasted opportunity. I love that line. Yes, yes. But yeah, the ancestors fighting the original stream is just kind of a way to get them to use up spell slots in time to like buy mm-hmm. the the briarwoods the time to do their ritual and or something. It is and uh, yeah, it was a drag. It dragged down the episode. Yeah, and here it, it definitely doesn't drag. It it doesn't take too long. It's actually like a nice, dis- it's it's a nice like callback to bringing back all of the dead. All of them. All of them. Except for the Dorolo corpses. We still don't know where those are. Yeah, we don't know what happened. I mean, those were Dorolo corpses, but you mean uh, the core family of Percy and Cassandra. The slightly yeah, fresher no, Dorolo corpses, but still pretty old Dorolo. Uh, yeah. Towson is notable in saying that he does not know what happened to him. Uh, mm-hmm. Anyway, not... Other than that, not a lot of good changes, I will admit. Yeah, like, the sequence is mostly improved because it is visual now, and they made the acid scene a little bit more epic. Yeah, I don't mind the acid scene. Like, it's like how how they changed also the solution to the acid scene, which is, uh, in the original, the acid scene is a lot more slow. Like, the solution Mm -hmm. is much more about, like, gradually dissolving the wall and, like, denting things and hitting certain crystals and... It's, it's like, very slow. There's no quick solution to it. Not very exciting. Not very exciting. And I do understand the need to have Grog be, like, the big damn hero here, because Grog has had the least time to shine so far, and he's going to spend the following fight unconscious. Yes, and I think that's a good job. I think that, that ultimately, like, the changes made to the acid fight scene are good. The changes yes. made to Ripley, not so good. Why? Why is she here? Why is she being kept alive? Like, especially with Cassandra, like... What? What? Why would Cassandra plead for her life? Yeah, like, sort of. 
it's not even that she gains any credit with like it, the, you could you can argue for a lot of things like for example like oh maybe she's trying to keep like maintain goodwill with the Briarwoods but like the Briarwoods have already turned their backs on uh, on Ripley, Ripley yeah so like that's why she's here that's why she's here so she's not gaining anything by keeping her alive yeah literally nothing there's not there's no point to this. Like, Ripley then uh, shows them the traps that she helped build or something, but, you know, who could have just scouted for those traps? The rogue. The rogue who has been doing nothing. The rogue who barely nothing. has a character arc. Not even has a character, who barely has a character. Maybe she should have been allowed to do something before being charmed. Again. 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 I don't know, it's just this, yeah. this whole sequence of events just kind of falls so flat. Yeah, the fact that she's built her own gun is like a side gag. Percy takes it and is like, huh. And she's like, huh, huh. And, okay. Like, the fact that this is horrifying, or the fact that it's kind of terrifying, that, like, it's an indication that Ripley has been actively stalking him. Like, there's an implication- That is missing! The thing is, is that, like, I don't know, the menace of Ripley is gone? Like, the fact that she's, like, an- act- Oh, we also talked about this, too. Like, the fact that, like, the decision to keep her alive as posed is, like, a, a good decision on Percy's part, but, like, ultimately, no. The decision in- in, no. in the stream to keep- Ripley alive for longer is very selfish on Percy's part. Yeah, on on stream he does it so because he can take more revenge sooner and also the only reason they even take her with them is because she can give them information about where Cassandra is. Dangling that carrot, making it... That is missing because Cassandra is already here because they broke the fucking sequence. Yes, they broke the sequence and suddenly like Cassandra's here and Cassandra has like little to no dialogue. Her actions do not make sense. Yeah, like what... What even? What? Didn't she torture you too? Like how? Like, did we did get this elaborate torture flashback and then we're supposed to be like, oh yeah, cool thing, keep her alive. Like, no! No! Shoot her! I don't it. Yes. Haven't we killed people to feed the demon that were not as bad as Ripley? There's so much more we don't have that scene. Like, in the show, the show is like very unique and that there's no references to, to, no references to what Ripley did to like, he does not say what she did to him. Yeah. It is not hinted but with But the scars. chemistry between them is weirdly heated, and it's menacing, and it uh, makes you wonder about things, and... Ugh. Yeah, like, that fear of, like, not knowing is achieved so much better, and, like, the fact that, like, we have a scene of her literally torturing Percy, and yet she's not as menacing, and the chemistry isn't there, is, like, so blatant. Mm-hmm. And it makes me sad. Wasted opportunity. Wasted opportunity. I mean, you kind of need her there, because if you leave out Percy's death, it's like, what are you even doing this show for? Yeah, like, what is this show even for if you're not going to kill Percy? Uh, Seriously. Yeah. What other stuff happens in this episode? I know that I had other gripes. Oh, yeah. Show us Grog's um. dick. <laughs> show us Grog's dick. Show me the dick. I want to it's see got it. a name. Mr. Winky? I got to see it. I know Pike got to see it, and I'm sure it didn't look good. I'm sure that it was blistering and gross, but you know what? Cowards? You want a blistering and gross penis? If that's what it means to get... I fight for equality, Yana. I do not fight for my own pleasure. That if... <laughs> if looking at a blistery I'm... Goliath dick is what I need to get equality on TV, so be it! I was about to argue that just showing boobs twice doesn't really isn't the same as showing um, male frontal nudity. However, we did get a lot of yonic imagery. So much yonic imagery. Even this. Even okay. Also, gripe. Minor. I know that I said we only get like one minor gripe per person, but uh, another minor mm. gripe. I don't like any. I don't like the the, the Dorola family crest at all. It looks like a. It looks like a birth canal. <laughs> The scene where Keyleth just um, makes the moon come out and the light come out, and that's actually when Elida decides to uh, raise all the dead, um, is pretty cool. The sky ride, it meant a lot to Marisha, apparently. Um, but the tree of the Dorolo crest does look like a vaginal it canal, It looks yes. like a vaginal canal. And the, the Chaldore crest looks like a vagina. Every single door in the palace. It's so weird. <laughs> It's a very yonic culture. So yeah, maybe we were owed a dick because they somehow managed to make every single tower not as phallic as they usually are. Yes, I am owed a dick. I shall have my pound of flesh. Probably literally a pound. I bet <sighs> that's about what Grog's dick weighs. <sighs> okay, I think that's all I had to say about this episode. Is there anything else you had to say about this episode? <laughs> um, nope.
Okay, moving forward. Ripley is pointless. What is any, what is all of this here for? Cassandra just, like, just does not feel right at all. Yeah, it's just okay. Nice effort. I guess. Would we rate this one? Uh, we gave it a five because we were really high on the um, actual adapting uh, the source material oh, again right. because those things were actually on the show yes. and improving upon those fight scenes. So yeah, we could, we had a lot of trouble here with like defining what is a red. Cause, like it is literally a retcon that like. You know. Sometimes retcons can also make for good adaptations as a thing. Yes, bad retcons can make good adaptations too. But sometimes, i.e. Ripley... Sometimes you retcon yourself out of any meaning, yeah. Yeah, sometimes you spend so much time retconning that, like, the adaptation itself... This is also, like, generally, like, the problem with the entire show. It's just... You need to understand what the pieces are doing before you move them. We'll talk about that later. Okay. Episode 11. We're down to the final two. Whoa! This is where it gets good. Okay. Now, the summary for this one should be pretty short, right? Do you want to read it or should I read it? I'll read it. Alrighty. Episode 11. Approaching the Ziggurat, Ripley is not here for this shit anymore and runs away. Good for her. Percy manages not to Mm -hmm. stop her despite his demons compelling him to shoot her. He then immediately blows their totally existing cover anyway and fights and fight scenes ensue. Uh... Siblings fight siblings, mages fight mages, and everything is really fucking cool. Eventually, Keyleth kills Silas, Delilah moves on to the next chamber, and summons a little annihilation orb and tries to finger Vex to death, but hits Keyleth instead. Yep. So the fight That's choreography. pretty much about it. It's the, it's the best episode of the show. It's the best episode of the show. I'm sorry to tell you guys this. It's literally... It's... The next one has a higher score, but this is the best episode. Yes. Holy fuck. The choreography. Like, we were so down on the show when we watched it the first time up to this point in the two episodes, two or three episode chunks, three episode chunks, I think. Yes. Um, that they came that it came out in. We just got to this episode and we're like, "Fuck!" Like, God damn it! We have to stand. We have to stand. You don't like, want to stand. No. Um, we were offended at how good this episode is because it is really, really good. Yeah, the flow. I, it's. I know that like it's essentially just one elaborate fight scene, but like the flow. Yeah, from but it's like indi- five elaborate fight scenes. Yeah. The, flows is a, the flow is amazing. The flow is it's amazing. Uh, from like one individual. The fight. moment where Keila starts drawing the energy from the sun tree to her. Yes. Oh. Can you hear me, sun tree? It's me, Keila. Are you there? Not God. Sword of God, Godly Tree, yes, whatever. It's a... And the music, the music on the show, by the way, is great. Yeah, the music of the show is really good. Uh, Scanlan is muted for most of it. Wonderful. Should Wonderful. happen more often. Yes. Uh, there's a... F- Vex and Vax hitting each other is also amazing. Great. I <laughs> love how much like Vex is just fully like, okay, I'll kill him then. And then just like... Continues to punch him to the ground. We've talked about this before. This absolutely makes no sense. This is one of those, like, rule of cool moments where, like, they're both so weak. <laughs> yes. They're both... Yes, Vex is a little bit stronger, but Vex has a strength of seven. If they actually did hand-to-hand combat, it would just be a slappy spice. It's just like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stop hitting yourself. Stop hitting yourself. <laughs> yeah. It's cool to watch. I mean... At the same time, Percy's kind of fighting Cassandra hand to hand, and she's been trained in close combat, and he isn't. It's like what? <laughs> yes, and you can uh, you can feel the the animation bump here. Like there's a part with the uh, with Silas and this is Pike. where the money went. There's a part with Silas and Pike, and you're like, oh yeah, that's where the money went. Like the the yep. There's also like a very very funny part that like absolutely killed me this time, where like the whole time we're watching this, we're going like, wait wait, where's Grog? Where's Grog again? Where would Grog go? Where's Grog? And then he's oh, just like unconscious on the ground. Okay. Oh, he's just starfished in the corner. <laughs> just to, oh, Grog died. I think. <laughs> Good for him. He's just vibing. Also, Grogleth. Grogleth real. Grogleth real. Grogleth true. Grogleth good. Also, Pikeleth. Also, Pikeleth. I think honestly, my favorite part of this this whole episode is um, when like Kiel does the sunbeam and Grog is like yes. You know, I can take I it. I can take it. Like, give it to me. Ah, yeah, that's ah, sexy. Ah, love that sexy. shit. Ah. I also like we discussed like the change from the bag of holy dicks. It was fine. I mean, you would have expected to stick with the bag of holy dicks given the tone of the show otherwise, but they didn't, and it worked better. The show has itself gone through a character arc where they are no longer quite so embarrassed about being an animated show, nor quite so embarrassed about being an mm-hmm. adaptation. 
Mm-hmm. It's all in, baby. All in. We're emotionally vulnerable. We are pulling out all the stops. This is it. This is what this show can be. And the fact that it hasn't been for the past ten episodes is what makes us the most upset. Yes. We're upset not because the whole show is bad. We're upset because the highs are so high and the lows are so low. But it just makes the, makes you look at all the lows and go, why? Why? Yeah, and they literally everything at their disposal to make this better. It just, like... Most of the show just needed another tour through the writing room. Yeah, that's really what it feels like. It feels like this episode went through the most polish. It felt like this episode is just tight. It is close. It even has like... There wasn't a lot of dialogue to be written here. <laughs> no, 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 no. There's really good dialogue, too. Like, remember, yeah. like, the... There's a, there's even, like, good shenanigans. Like, there's the part when, towards the end where, um... Uh, Delilah runs to the next chamber right after uh, Silas dies. And... You hear, like, Pike and Grog arguing about who should get, like, who's opening the door. (laughs) And, like, that's really funny. And, like, I like that. (laughs) That was really good. Yes. Uh, There's also um, the the fucking Delilah scream after uh, Silas dies, which breaks through the spell. Love that stuff. Ray Griffin is just, oh. Woof. Woof. She was on the the, uh, Q&A for these episodes and Boy, is she fucking amazing and also just such a fun person. And she really loved this part. Which you can tell in the performance, but... She loves to play a good villain. Yeah. You can tell from her performance and stuff. Yeah, she also, like, a villain that you can, like, really bite into. Like, like, yes. like Azula and, like, Delilah. Like, villains with substance. And, like, she got her, she got a good yes. villain. Yes. Yes. And by the way... Mm-hmm. Um, on these Q and A's, it was revealed that originally the Gray was just there to as scratch, like to stand in as as Delilah's voice for the um, <laughs> for first like rough draft and stuff. And then the cast is like, "Yeah, we did this so we could cast you." Which to me, kind <laughs> of implied that they did they didn't have entire say about all casting decisions, but fought this yeah. one through because the scratches were so amazing. Which fuels my suspicion that maybe the Cassandra voice wasn't their wasn't their choice. Yeah, that makes sense. It seems like everything here is a bit of a compromise. Like you, you give some, you take some. You got Amazon money. You do have to you have to do what Amazon says. Yes, and I think that like there's it's a, there's a level of like I don't want to just blame the cast for this because like it really takes a team to make a to make any show. Like no person can make a show on their own, and the yeah. problems in this show are are sometimes caused by the cast and sometimes as blatantly as. You wrote the fucking episode. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's it's it takes like hundreds of people to make a TV show. Yes. Oh, 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 oh. Um, someone has a writing credit on this episode. Ooh. Can you guess who? It better not be. It better not be Sam. It isn't Sam. Ooh, is it? Is it Arcee It's Travis. Travis. It's Travis? Which explains why the fighting is so good, actually. <laughs> yeah, okay, goddamn, Travis. It's Travis and Eugene's son wrote this, which like... Which was the last episode Eugene Sun wrote? Oh, episode three. Well, that also had good fight- fighting choreography and stuff, so... Mm. Yeah, I guess, like, Travis is not a very good character writer, but he is a very good fight scene writer, so good for him. And doesn't that just make all of the sense? That makes so much sense. All right. While we're singing this episode's phrase- praises, <laughs> when should we talk about the 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 fingers of death. I mean, this is where it, this is what we end on, and it's kind of a key aspect for the next episode too. So this is where we talk about who gets fingered. Yeah, like I said, and I I'm gonna quote myself literally and say, my problem isn't that Vex wasn't fingered here, is that she wasn't fingered at all. Yeah, yeah. Like especially this shows Vex could have used a good scene where people freak out about her almost dying and actually care about her. Yeah, like the problem with. The other side of having Vex be such a strong leader type, and like it really fucking works for her to be the strong leader type here, is that you don't get a lot of interiority with her. You get you don't get to be like you don't get to see a lot of vulnerability from Vex. You don't get to have like moments of Vex. And and I'm not I don't think this is always going to be the case. I hope that this is something that like when we watch the show years and years in the future and all the seasons all together, we will be able to watch like an arc happen where Vex becomes more vulnerable. I think that's my biggest hope. Yeah, but... I mean, remember the parts about Laura I told you about when she was like, this is all what's going on and this is how Vex avoids being seen as vulnerable and da 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 I hope we get more from that. 
I hope, Laura I hope we get more of that. I hope scene. Laura gets a writing credit. She should write. She should. She's a really good writer. But yeah, it's ultimately, I'm not sad that, like, I understand why Keyleth gets fingered, finger of death here. I think it, it makes more sense. It allows Vex to be more up and mobile and, and be talking and communicating yeah, with Percy. Yeah, we need Vex kind of up for the next scene. And let's be real, the entire I don't care if she's dead thing would not have worked if Vex was the one dying with Percy here. And also friendly reminder that when faced with this exact scenario in the original stream, Percy was like, yeah, I'll take those 30 points of falling damage. For Vex, fine. He's a, he's a good boy. But yeah, it's just, it, it, I'm sad that it happens. I know why it happens and I'm not going to fault them for me. I think it's the right decision ultimately. I'm just sad that mm-hmm. like, I wish that, that like, this this decision wasn't this decision wasn't made in isolation and like mm. yeah anyway just do better for season two is what I'm hoping like more vex interiority season two mm-hmm. and three and four and, and more five. trinket get a good trinket. bear animator yeah just get one person in whose job it is to make to make t- trinket do the thing <laughs> yes I'll do it Nothing. I'll do it I'll learn how to animate <laughs> <laughs> will you really. Ah, uh, no. But <laughs> if, if for you Trinket, can hire Bob as a writer, she has a degree in that, technically, too. Thank you. I'm just a goose on the internet with two degrees. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have a lot of degrees. What else can... What else do we want to say about episode 11 before we move on to the last episode of season one? I'm pretty sure that's it. Oh, yeah, you pretty also sure. pointed out when we were watching this that, that Orthex insisting on Percy killing Ripley before she gets away at the, downstairs is actually kind of altruistic of him. Yes, you're right. Also, the entire sequence is just so ridiculous because the justification is if you shoot her now, our cover is blown. Like, guys, you as a group are walking up in a very echoey room, the one stairwell, open stairwell, no cover, leading up to the top of this pyramid. What fucking cover? Now, granted, Silas and Delilah were making out at the time, but like, it's, a, it's not gonna last Could you for that long. Could they see that from down there, though? Good question. <laughs> I mean, nobody said, quickly, let's sneak up on them while they're busy. And then eyebrow wangling. <laughs> if the ziggurats are rocking, don't come a knocking. <laughs> How often do you think they're. Oh, all the time. <laughs> even in the original, like, not even just this ziggurat, which is all clean and nice, like in the original ziggurat with all the wiggling corpses, they fucking that one too. Ooh. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Last episode. Episode 12. Yay. The darkness within. So Keyleth is dying and magic isn't working, so they move everyone, including Delilah, elsewhere where the magic works again. Pike also kind of zapped out between scenes. It's oh, not between scenes, but we should see her. But when trying to heal, heal Keyleth beforehand, it, it's fine. A showdown with Percy's inner demon ensues until he breaks free by hurting himself. The solution to all your problems. Cassandra <laughs> kills Delilah, everyone wraps up at Whitestone and put her- Cassandra in charge. Back in Imon, Uriel steps down and dragons approach. They sure do. They sure do. Which, like, the, the fact that the summary is so short kind of shows you how much of this episode we spent with Percy battling the demon. Yeah, Percy and Vex battling the demon. Yeah, I'm Vex has a better time getting through to him. Then, then cast us for reasons. For reasons. Hmm. I will start by saying there is no fucking way on earth <laughs> that Percy and Cassandra sword fought. <sighs> yeah, no, not as children. Mostly because Percy is like five to seven years older than her. Yeah, that's like a, a he would have been like a ten year old fighting a three year old. Yep. I mean, in this they are apparently second and third. Yeah, but like, even if they were closer in age, like, Percy's gonna be rolling his eyes at every time he has to pick up a play sword. Yep. I mean, he does wield a sword in the campaign at some point, very proficiently. Kills a dragon. Yeah, and he, well, not kill, and but sometimes hits one. when he uses screams. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he does tend to make squeaky noises whenever he's in close combat. Yeah, he doesn't like it, it makes him nervous. Mm-hmm. Anytime Percy's rushing towards an opponent with a so- with sword drawn, it's always screaming and panicking. Yep. Yep. Anyway, so the Orthax sequence is fucking sick. So fucking sick. The, like, amazing fight scene coordination from the previous episode holds. 
Even though this Definitely. episode was written by Sam and another dude, the one who's two. Yeah, I admit that, like, you mentioned this too, that, like, I, I really like uh, Darling Take the Mask Off, or what is it, Darling... Take Jack, Off the Mask. It? Darling Take Off the Mask, which always seems to me like slightly wrong wording. It is. Unfortunately, the fandom has adopted it wholesale. Whatever. Darling Take the Mask Off has better Caden. Uh, the but, meaning is different, the context of the scene is different, we will get into this when we discuss Persadia later on. Yes, but when he does take the mask off, he's crying under there, which I think is like a good touch. It's a nice yes. touch. I also like the touch of her literally standing in front of the gun. Mm-hmm. It's all very, like, going to Georgia by the mountain goats. Okay. Do you know that song? I think it's on my, play- my Persadia no. playlist. Maybe. And you smile as, I, as you lift the gun from my... No. Flooded with joy, right where I stand. I don't think I've come that far. Your playlist fucks me up before then. We're going to have a musical episode before Critical Role does. Let's think about (laughs) you standing in the doorway, and that it's you, and that you're standing in the doorway. I'm sitting at my desk. All right. (laughs) Ruin my fun, why don't you? I like serenade you with the most romantic (laughs) tones of the song the Mountain Goats has to have a preface to every time they perform it about how, like, it's not actually very romantic. Which I think is very Percy. True. It's very much what Taliesin goes on to tell us. He's not actually that great. And, like, dude, you don't get it. <laughs> you just don't get it. I also really like the way that uh, there's Vex's voice while he's in, his, he's in his depths, as they say. Oh, yeah. Oh, also, I kind of like how Vax manages to replicate Keelan's druid healing spell with Scanlan's help, but hmm, that's cute. Yeah, that's nice. It's cute. I like it. It's nice to have. I wish that they, they had done something with that. Well, he does kind of pay attention to it, but like, I would have liked like a little scene. Yeah, she ha- yeah, he helped her when she does it to Cassandra. Yeah, that's true. I would have liked to see him like talk about it with her. Like, you gotta show me how to do that some Like, I don't know. It's well, cute. I like it. It's a nice. It's 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 one of those moments where you wish it happened before the love confession, but that wouldn't have made sense. It's nice. I like yeah. it. It's a good scene. It's nice. Mm-hmm. I forgot to say the point that you made while we were watching. The Percy in the stream is very calm when he's a gun to his head, gun to Delilah. Oh yeah, no. Whereas this, he's very Percy is negotiating. Yes, here's very jerky and and sort of out of control, which is a decision to make. I don't think it's the wrong decision that. The calm... I mean, the entire the entire emotional vibe of this whole thing is completely different. Yes, exactly. Which, I think it works. It works especially for the show. Which also shows you all that we can be gracious and different isn't always worse. No, different always isn't I'm not saying it's better, worse. but it is fine. Yes, it's fine. It's not bad. It works for the show. It works for the scene. That's nice. It's, uh... One of the one of the high points of the show. Yeah, definitely one of the high points of the episode because there, this episode does have some low points. Once we're out of the combat, yes. Yes, once we're out of the <laughs> combat. But I really generally like a lot of the the. I think the execution of the the, the entire Orthax scene, especially with the visuals, is excellent. I love yes. the moment where where Keyleth points to the smoke and it like passes over Percy's face. You know, she's like, mm-hmm. there's the demon. It's great. I love that Keyleth is the one who... And Scanlan goes like, I didn't think it was literal. I thought he was just depressed, which is... <laughs> That's a good He's line. He's manic depressed. Uh, it's a good line. It's a good enough line for, for Scanlan, as far as we get from Scanlan. Oh, I I also liked the way that they worked. You will fight this monster inside of you. And and I... <laughs> yeah, she didn't get, tell us... She didn't say his full she name, didn't... though. His entire full name was only mentioned once yes. on the show. Though I will admit that I think this is executed a little bit better than the original stream. Because in the original stream, you can very much tell that Laura's checking her notes. <laughs> yeah, Laura, I mean, I love I love that about her that she actually made like, okay, I should write down his full name in case I have to say it in a dramatic yes. moment. And then she reads it out. And it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't feel yeah. like she didn't know his name. It felt more like when you pick up a calculator and you do like five times times two just to be like okay i know this answer but like i'm gonna check anyway <laughs> like she but thousands of people are watching me let's just sh- make sure i get this right yeah like she doesn't say it that haltingly she just says it slightly haltingly to the point where you can be like oh, okay you're reading it from the notebook <laughs> percival frederickstein from yoso koloski the, the role of the third you will fight this monster inside of you yes just enough so I do think that they, they incorporated it slightly smoother than the original stream. Yeah. Yeah. And then and then we're out of the woods and into the post 
Oh my god. I just mm-hmm. forgot what I'm so sad that they didn't adapt. What? You remember when they're in like the congratulations speech during uh in the the two weeks between or, or <laughs> when they bump the microphone? Well, you skipped a bunch. I know. You skipped a bunch. But I just remembered it suddenly when he bumped the microphone. Well, uh, Ashley bumped the microphone. Ashley bumped the microphone. That incorporated this into into the speech of was that Archibald? <laughs> I think that was Archibald, right? Uh, and it may even keep her Yenin. It's one of those two. And God. Just, <laughs> this, this, is how you, this is how you do a fart joke, people. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> and the and way everyone every... is just breaking one after the other. Yeah, very slowly. It's not an immediate break. It's one of those where like everyone just slowly dissolves into laughter. Anyway, Except for Talison, he's worked two years on a sitcom. He can hold this relaxed face all day. Yes, amateurs, amateurs. Anyway, so Scanlan throws the gun into the acid. Yeah, Percy isn't quite as upset as he was originally. Like he, uh, notably, he gives in and is like, "Well, oh, good call." After he sees the demon kind of dissolving, which the real Percy would never do. The real Percy was in in hold of person the entire time, getting his face cupped by Vex. And he was still screaming. Vex kissed him, Cassandra told him to get his shit together. And then slapped him. He said his best line of their entire relationship, which is like, You were never mother's favorite. <laughs> she told me. She told me. He's such a spiteful <laughs> asshole the entire time. Uh, I miss their I miss their sibling dynamic. God. I just love Percy. He's he's so funny. That's the thing that I do think that the show doesn't quite get is like Percy's just so fucking funny. Like he is cool. He's a cool guy. He's so such a dork though. Yeah, they kind of made him into like even when he was not in an emotional uh, trauma state, they kind of made him into more of a nag instead of like the sarcastic asshole sitting in the corner watching everyone making a fool of themselves. Yeah, and to skip towards the end of the episode, he tells Scanlan that his song is pretty good or whatever. And like Percy would never Percy would never. The closest Percy has ever Who is come this watch of your time with Percy. To complimenting <laughs> Scanlan's work is when he was asleep and like Scanlan couldn't think of a rhyme and Percy was like and like mumbled a rhyme for him. When was that? That was in episode 44? Oh, I don't recall. Uh, it's with Kasha. Scanlan is, like, trying to come up with a rhyme for something, and, like, he can't oh. quite. And then, like, Talison, you could just see him, like, suffering. Like, <laughs> I can <laughs> And so he, like, he mumbles a rhyme in response, and then Scanlan's like, no, Percy sleep, sleep rhyme. I don't remember that. It's cute. Anyway... Percy would fucking mm-hmm. never. Percy, even in his most, most would never. mentally healthy state, is such a little bitch. Mm-hmm. My wife is a bitch and I love him. <laughs> yeah, so we then, like, uh, Cass is like, it's cool if you, forg- you forgive this bitch, Percy, I won't. Stabby stab. And, like, I don't think, like, why would... It's, uh... And that was the last time we ever saw Delilah. The absolutely very last time. This is how you kill a necromancer in a way that matters. <laughs> Mm. I like the, to think that Delilah really is just a very persistent case of, of fungus. <laughs> she appears to be. She appears to be. So then they, you know, whatever, take their throne back. They they go back to their keep where uh, Grog tries to install a door back on its hinges. Everything is fine. You just skipped a whole bunch. What did I skip? Um, you skip the conversations around the tree where Percy's like, Cass, you are the true heir of white stone. Right, Which is yeah. a thing that apparently matters and makes sense when the entire point is that it doesn't make sense that Percy leaves her alone to rule. She's like, 17. Yeah, um, only 17. <laughs> if we you can rule, you can lead. Having the Why are you time? singing Abba and I'm singing and I'm singing uh Heathers? <laughs> That's a good explanation Trip of our, the other our way dynamic. <laughs> this is all dynamic flipped. I sing Abba, you sing uh, musicals. Okay. Okay. Um and also Vex does the love confession thing again. Cute is like nope Because of your sister. And she looks at Vex. 
She doesn't actually say the because camera pans over to Vex. I don't even know what Vex is doing in that scene, but she does, and then she she gives Keyleth props. She's still got a bloody shoulder. Yeah, her, the the fur on her shoulder has been ruined. My favorite tiny detail during that entire discussion is that while this entire discussion is happening, you can look in the background and there's just a a a character. Like a side NPC who's just crouched in the background the entire time. And I don't know why that's so funny to me. (laughs) He's just crouching there. It's like, okay. All right. He's just pretending he can't hear this, huh? He's just vibing. Yeah, then there's... Also, we lost on the tense conversation between between Vax and Keyleth that everyone on stream back in the day was just hiding their faces. Yeah. No, don't mind us. You're having a moment. Just being the most middle school assholes. Talson just grabbing his his entire scarf and wrapping it around his yeah. face. Yeah. Ah, good times. Yeah, it's a good time. Good times. Good times. Good times. And unfortunately, we do not get Sentry. No. That was one of that was one of the losses that you regretted the most on the, on the Q and A. By the way. Oh, are they As never? They are they never gonna do Sentry? I don't know if they're never gonna do this, but they didn't manage to do it here. To be fair. On stream, the sun tree was a very different kind of tree when Keyleth talked to him here. Yeah. Though, like... Good. I always love first first sun tree. For, Matt never quite gets to the same place. He, like, the, the tree Keyleth talks to in Palos Realm was very similar to first time sun tree. Weirdly, yeah. But the actual sun tree gets, like, more and more Matthew McConaughey. Yeah. That's strange. And then... And then we get to the thing... Then we get a short montage of them living at their keep in Iman. Keyleth has put flowers everywhere. Scarlet has written a song. Everyone is happy. And then they get summoned to uh, Uriel, who, as you pointed out, is, seems like he's making a YouTube influencer Instagram apology. Yes. Or like a pol- politician sex scandal announcement. Like, yeah. Even like holding his wife's hand and like having their children arranged. I've also... Noted that, mm-hmm. like, if you if you kind of blur your eyes, it looks like uh, Kima and uh, <laughs> Seeker Sub are also his children. <laughs> Is that racist? A little bit. It's certainly anti-halfling. Yeah, so he's holding a speech and suddenly Vex has a migraine, which can only mean one thing, or four things. <laughs> Isn't it? It's, it's, uh, it's dragons, it's... Uh, Devils, I think? Yeah, technically she can also sense like devils, I think. Yeah, but she uses it mostly against. There's just a lot of dragons in this campaign. Yes, it's a dragon heavy campaign. And, and here they are! Yeah, I love this. I love this final shot. It's so good. <sighs> that was another thing we were offended by, like how this uh, final reveal is just like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, how is this good? Oh god, we'll have to watch this again. Yes. Wings. So what did we rate this last episode, by the way? A 9.5. Yeah, not bad. We really liked, we really liked the vexiness. What can I say? Yeah, we were, we're easy to please. So uh-huh. now that we've actually finished, finally, talking about all the episodes, we can just talk about the show as a whole. Yeah, honestly, it is amazing how the experience of going through this both watching and uh, just talking about it is the same every time. We start out with... Uh, in a pretty bad mood and everything sucks and just by the end we are I'm so, having a good time right now. Yeah, I'm having such a good time. <laughs> so what are some some major like things that we want to discuss show as a whole? Other than the fact that like it goes through such an arc where you start so disappointed and then you get happy yeah. and then you get disappointed again and then you finish happy. Yeah, like um so if there's a list of key questions that we're going to talk about is it's ten subjects. It's the ones we were like, we're getting into this later. It is four hours later. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. Jesus fucking Christ. As I said, this is very much unabashed book snobbery now. Yes. Okay. So first of all, the storytelling is horribly insecure in places, source materials, weaknesses, instead of its strengths pretty much at every turn. Yes. It just feels like a very <laughs> bare story, and it does get better at this, like we said in the last two episodes. Yeah. When they allow themselves to be sincere... That is, by the way, always the key to better writing. Just allow yourself to be sincere. You don't have to be completely irony poisoned. Yes. And also, like... Honestly, the kid in the corner making jokes about everything is just the most insecure person in the room. Yeah, when you have that kind of voice in the back of your head saying, make a joke about it, you have to interrogate that. Like, realize where that's coming from. Is it coming from genuine humor? Is it coming from insecure? And it feels like most of the time in the show it comes from insecure. Yes. Which is a problem. Also, what I mean by playing to the source material's weakness is that 
Like, I think a key example that made this clear to me is when I talked to my friends who knew nothing about the show, who were like, well, all the characters felt like really, really um, overly cliched stereotypes. And it's like, if you've been in the Critical Role fandom, that's the complaint you hear about Campaign 1 a lot. Yes. Because they start as very, very and cliche. Not <laughs> inaccurate. It's not inaccurate. And it's not something, inaccurate. It's something that I like about Campaign 1, is that they start as very, very basic characters, and very, very basic tropey characters, and then eventually they, they gain a lot of depth. The problem is when you don't let them gain yeah, depth. Yeah, and that's the strength of Campaign 1, the amount of depth they manage to add to that, the, the ways they develop from that, that weren't all completely in their own solitary backstories. There's just so much more to every single character by the midpoint of the campaign, by honestly by the Briar was part of the campaign, than there has been, than there was to them in yes, the beginning. Yes, so much more. And some of which happens. The characters just get so much richer and complexer, and it's a wonderful journey to to. And it's to like behold. so. It, it's you watch it accumulate so slowly and so gradually that like. It's hard to define these characters without a lot of nuance. Like, for example, I think that they actually had a lot of problems writing Grog in this, and they only really got Grog voice towards the end, which actually makes a lot of sense that, like... Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would make sense, like, why they got kind I mean, of Grog voice when Travis wrote his character, but, like, Grog isn't just <laughs> naive stupid, and he isn't just violent. He's somewhere between the two. Yeah, but... Grog also has, like, for example, when he doesn't get uh, people dying or grief or something, Grog is actually, has actually the most mature approach to grief from all of, yes. all of them. Sometimes. sometimes he does. And sometimes he has, like, moments of just, like, true, like, genuine, like, sadness and disappointment. And, like, these feelings of... of... His intelligence is low. His charisma and his wisdom are yes. fine. And, I don't know, he, he's capable of doing both in the way of, of, like, managing to balance that, like... He's never quite naive. He's usually kind of stupid, and, and he's very simple. I think he, he cares about very simple things, mm-hmm. but his mm-hmm. his care about those simple things is often nuanced. Yes, yes. So that's what I. Uh, so I just um, especially like no, honestly, kind of the whole way through this the show struggles with moving away from the stereotypes. I know it's easy as a characterization to just start mm-hmm. out with that. But they don't really get that much depth. No, and, and you feel this even with, like, Alora. Especially with Alora. Yeah, like, Alora isn't a very, like, cliched character, and yet she's been made into a cliched character. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, also, to be fair, that uh, Scale and Grok are the ones who suffer from this the most, and they do the least during this arc. I am a, also who suffers from this is Keyleth. Like, this is so, this is so, um, so typical with what I've complained about before, that when it comes to being um, demanding answers about what is going on and telling him to stop and whatever, and be supporting him, Vex and Keyleth swapped positions here. Vex was the one who was supportive, Keyleth was the one who was morally up, morally um, upstanding and wanted answers and also a stop to the smoking stuff. Yes, and like the loss of that just doesn't feel right, you know? Yeah, no, it feels right if you perceive of Vex as a very stern, bitchy character who is not very nice. That's not really her. No, it's not. Uh, and, like, Keyleth isn't just soft and, and gentle. Like, she is very demanding of... Uh, like, I think that, like, Keyleth has very high expectations mm-hmm. of people. I think that, like... Yeah, Percy phrase it rubs so many people the wrong way about Keyleth on the stream that she is very demanding of herself and others to be better. Yeah, which like Percy commends her for in his. Uh, yeah, death I was about letter. to mention the death letter. The death letter phrases it perfectly. Of like, yeah, you have really really high expectations for everyone. Like, well, we have to try. Like, we will try our best to meet meet us meet those expectations and like try to forgive us when we don't. Yeah, so Keyleth here is just kind of. Not in a place where she is, where she. I mean, to be fair, they also cut off most of the con- most of the conflict because of the of of the darkness and escalation. Yeah, we we'll get to that a little bit later. Yeah, this is kind of like my problem with the whole thing of like moving things around before you understand what you're doing. Like you can move yes. around. Like the problem with moving around the conflict and having like these very very incoherent character arguments is that it's very clear that they don't fully understand what those character conflicts were. Yes. Like, you can't just put an argument here and have it be a r- about Percy doing a violent thing when, again, the way this was framed in the episode previously was just he whipped around and Vax was there and he was a little startled and in the middle of combat. Like, of course Vax would be spooked by this, but the entire thing just wasn't worth 
threatening to kill Percy over. Yeah, it almost feels like if you told like the story of this arc to like a toddler and then asked the toddler to relay it back to you. You know how like kids when they watch like a movie they'll be like, and then those two people they had a big argument and they yelled at each yeah. other and it's like, well, okay, but what mm-hmm. did they yell at each other? And, like then they yelled at each other and like. What is this conflict about? Are they talking to each other or is everyone doing like a separate argument for themselves? Yes, are they necessarily conflicting against each other? Because they aren't really at this point. So it just feels like they they didn't fully understand the character conflicts that they were happening before trying to rewrite them. And as a result, you kind of have like a, a... a couple... a stretch of episodes in the middle that are just like very uh, tensionless and very tense at the same very time. Very unfocused. Very unorganized. Yes. And a lot like of it just comes from... the goal is never really quite clear. The conflict is just muddy. And it drags. Yeah. And it, it really comes from like a, a both of this... Both like tangling up the physical stakes of like when they should be saving... Like when... when Like it, it moving the physical stakes of, of, of like saving Cassandra... Like, moving them forward, like, moving them earlier means that you don't have those, those physical stakes later. And shuffling around the emotional stakes means that the emotional stakes don't make sense anymore. So suddenly you have, a, like, a, yes. par- a plot that is progressing as the outline without any of the motives of the outline. <laughs> yes, and this can have massive consequences later on, because the way it happened here, it, as we mentioned before, with the best example is Ripley of writing a story without understanding what, or like rewriting and adapting without understanding why the original worked here. Mm-hmm. Is that there is absolutely no accountability on Percy's part for releasing Ripley into the world. He wanted to kill her so hard. Everybody else kept him from doing so. So when Ripley eventually comes back to kill him successfully, but the he... entire narrative symmetry is is just gone. Yeah, like what what is he getting like cosmically revenged for? Like, yeah, what is biting him in the ass right now? The person he wanted to kill but didn't? He didn't make a selfish choice here to spare her to get more of his revenge right now or to, or to get to his sister or anything. He didn't want her here. This wasn't the Percy decision, and it should have been a Percy decision. But Cassandra being there after, pre- after having this entire sequence broken up completely ruined the accountability. Yes. The, the future season, which is just like... Before you make a decision that moves around the goalposts by a big, huge margin, ask around and realize, like, really know what those goalposts are doing. Because, like, this is how you get, mm-hmm. like, this is how, like, moving around the scaffolding just, like, you can't just take off load-bearing walls, you know? And yes, and suddenly be surprised why, like, the ceiling in your house sinks on you. Yes. Like, I think that if they approach it with the same earnesty as they did this these last few scenes, Percy's death is still going to be devastating. Oh, I know it's totally going to be devastating. I just want it to be meaningful. Yes. Like, it's easy to make... And- the thing about Percy's death is that it's it's not just sad. It, it's easy to make something sad. It's hard to make something meaningful. It's not just meaningful. sad, it's kind of perfect? Yes, exactly. It's not just that it's sad. It would have been the perfect end to this character. There's a reason Taliesin was pretty much decided on, yeah, he's dead. This is the perfect way for him to go out. Mm-hmm. You can try, but, oh, oh, Vex wants me back. Oh, okay, okay, never mind. Never mind. Never mind. No Hamlet death for you. <laughs> Said Liam O'Brien, of all people. Yes, in the same <sighs> campaign. But, yeah, it's, it's okay, I think we've, we've hammered the point enough. We can move on to a different point, but yes. I agree with you yeah. completely. I mean, yeah, of course, we made this up together. <laughs> yes, that's true. Okay. Yes. Yeah, okay, my second point was, why? what is magic and why would anyone want to learn it? Which is, you can get over very quickly because it uh, was very confusing to me watching the show. The magic doesn't seem to have any defined rules. Keela doesn't even seem to know what she's casting at any point in time. The only reliable source of magic is whatever Delilah has going on. They're all speaking a weird language that nobody understands. Sp- I mean, like, spell yeah, sets just- are... A very ridiculous way of thinking about magic, and it certainly doesn't always lead to a good, like, plot. Yeah. But no, it, it doesn't. Is, it is good for, to have some structure, and, like, the fact that sometimes spells just don't work, and neither the characters nor the audience know why, it's not great. It's not great. No. It, also, like, this was kind of a plot point because Pike also didn't know why our magic failed, made the reasonable assumption, and then, nope, how dare you? How dare you even think that? That yes. is why this failed. Chicken, egg, whatever. Yes. I also think that, like, this is a problem that they need to hammer up before they continue with the series, because, like, I don't want to get into a scenario where, you know, resurrection rituals happen. 
And the audience is still confused about why a spell might work or might not work. Mm -hmm. Like, when you get to the point where you're telling the story where it actually matters when a spell fails or does not fail mechanically, you need to have it hammered out for that to matter. It can't be every single spell might work or might not work. Yeah. Also, you kind of undermine most characters' competence. I know but with Kira that's the point, but with others it's like, is this a thing they're supposed to be able to do? And also just raises the in-universe question, if the only reliable source of magic is apparently evil pacts, why doesn't everybody just do that? Good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyways, uh, the third point is, ended up mattering less, but it still was off-turning, is the escalation of violence, or let's say lack thereof, because we, again, start this entire thing by chopping someone's hand off in a bar brawl, making Percy shooting someone's hand off, who has worked for the people who killed his family, seem kind of, uh, sure, yeah. whatever. And it, it's, it, it's strange in ways, like, the violence is both um, heightened and neutered in different scenes. Like, we get, like, in many ways the violence is extreme. Like, we get people fully getting crushed by ghosts. But mm -hmm. we don't have Grog, Vax, and, and Percy grabbing a poor, you know, uh, lackey, tearing his tongue out and branding his face. Yeah, which uh, in the stream was an actual legitimate point to, to cause conflict. Because this was an yes. escalation. This was the spirit making per the, the demon making Percy turn crueler, and people noticing that. This was a legitimate thing to be upset about. But we lost that. Yeah, we lost that. It feels more like the violence is chosen sort of arbitrarily based on the whoever's writing the episode. Like, is this going to be a super violent episode, or is this going to be a non-violent episode, or, or a relative... There's no non-violent episodes, the, but less violent episodes. And also the, vi the violence committed by uh, the evil characters on this show is so over the top and gory at times that any kind of violence against them just feels immediately, like, to scale, no matter yes. what you do. Yes, I agree. Like it's, and I think part of that is just like the na the nature of visual medium is like it's always gonna seem. Yeah, you can tell that the first episodes were really used by the staff to indulge. Oh my god, we're in adult animation now. <gasps> yeah, we get to we get to dismember people and we get to crush this little lamb. Wow, we but are going to lovingly render all these innards. Yes, which sucks. I don't I don't really enjoy that, but like, fine. It's just the first two episodes. It's more like mm. the fact that there is no progression and that sometimes it feels like the character arcs go specifically against what we're being shown. Like, we're being shown that violence is extreme and it, it is at a pl plateau. Like, it is always extreme, it has always been extreme, it will always be extreme. But the characters aren't yeah. behaving in such a way. No, everyone is just completely desensitized. No, it's not just that everyone's so completely desensitized. By it's that, like, sometimes they're completely desensitized, and sometimes it's like, whoa, Percy, you shot off a guy's hand. For five minutes. For five minutes. Like, I don't know, the, the, the visual medium is often going actively against the story being told, and that sucks. Yes. Anyway. Okay, the next point is, I think something we discussed uh, adequately is the just... Did Pike just not know she's not Catholic? Yes. Like, she's very disconnected from her faith and its tenets, and, but we've been over this at length yeah, already, so... Yeah, I feel so. like to fix this a little bit, um, just make it make it more so obvious that Saren Ray is, a, is like a dwindled religion, like it is in canon. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like that would explain a lot, and that would justify a lot. Like, why doesn't Pike know a lot about her faith? Well, there's just not a lot of practice. There's not a lot of... She can't really sit down with someone and discuss how things are. She has to figure it out on her own. And... I think that would do a lot of legwork for this arc. Yeah. Anyway, that's all I had to say about it. Yeah, I'm, I think I pretty much said everything I had to say about this too. Do we want to talk more about Archie? No, I don't want to talk about Archie anymore. I've said all I wanted to say about Archie. I never want to hear the name Same. Archie ever again. He added nothing, and even his death was underwhelming. Like, why was he even here? You could have just, you could have just stuck to the actual script. This is, by the way, where I want to quote like um one of the. Um, in the arms of an Archie. <laughs> so there is this letter or fax or something that the guy who adapted Gone with the Wind once wrote about how to make good adaptations. And like, Gone with the Wind, the book, is really fucking racist, even for the time it was written in. So is the movie. It is a good adaptation. Like, that's the point. And one of the key points was that it is always better to cut things than to change them. Yeah. And to cut things than to add them. 
And Archie is like a perfect example of that. Like, if you had just not made your point, made your plot center around this random new character for four episodes and just stuck to what was already there, it would have been so much better. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It would have been stronger and more closely motivated with the characters, and you would have avoided the really awkward what are we fighting about, what are the conflict here moments that they had about Percy doesn't want to lead a rebellion, he just wants to kill the Briarwoods. Sorry, Percy, this is the same. This is the same. Everyone has the same goals here. Well said. I agree completely. What haven't we discussed yet? Clear The role of family dynamics and you. I feel like we also discussed this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was important that they had a bit of an age gap, that, Cass- that Cassandra was the youngest to who acted years her senior. It was important that they weren't really each other's favorite sibling and had very little to do with each other and kind yeah. of just had to stuck it out together anyways. Yeah, it, it matters. It matters that, like, at the end of the day, they are still, like, the fact that they weren't loosest kind of melts away because they're the only ones left. Yes. Until, you know, um, Percy marries, but, like... <laughs> yeah. The next one is about gun control. Oh, right. I don't think this show understands that, like, guns are bad. Yeah, the entire horror of the guns is very understated. Like, the demon in the gun is bad. The gun itself? Meh. The fact that yeah. Ripley has a gun? Oh. Yeah. It doesn't really understand, like, the concept that, like, by releasing Ripley... Like, Ripley enters and leaves with these, and, like, there's so little... There's not even, like... There's not even a scene with the, 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 the gunpowder merchant to show you that, like, you lose fingers. Like, it's it's... That is later. The gunpowder merchant loses his fingers later. He loses his fingers later, so he's introduced earlier. Yeah, but he doesn't know what he's doing, and he still has all his fingers. That's true. I just, I think that, like, there's a sense of, of sort of the immediacy and the, the industrialization of violence. Uh, the fact that, yes. like, it's just not Ripley's, considered. Ripley's intent isn't just to make guns, but to mass manufacture guns. I think that's lost, and it's a shame, because, like, that's, I don't think it's impossible to make this work happen, but that's, that's work that you're not going to be able to, like, that's Makeup yeah. work. Like now you're gonna be having to backfill. They, they should have just. They should have just made the cat made the party find letters by her somewhere. Yes, somewhere. That was important. That was important setup. Frankly, that was more important than having a, a torture backstory. Or Archie. Or Archie. Okay, that's all I had to say about the guns. Cool. I'm pretty sure we actually hit everything about the Vexleth erasure. Ah, but what about the Vexleth propaganda? And the queer baiting. Yes, yes, there's this dynamic going on here that's a little baffling because on the one hand they play down the Vex and Gilmore relationship with this technically good because nothing comes her, but it makes the scenes with them and Gilmore makes his dick at the end very uncomfortable. Yes, it feels more like tokenized in a way. Yes, but Gilmore also has the grace to notice that Vex is now tequila on his own, so no awkward breakup talk. Yes. No awkward to be fair, it doesn't talk. even look like they're dating, so hey. But at the same time, this show is really, really playing up the Vexleth. Yeah, in ways that don't often, don't really make sense sometimes, and I think some ways that are, might not have been intentional. Like, the part where she tells, I like, I some of them, some of them I think might be intentional. The amount of times Keyleth blushes at Vex is, uh, can't be unintentional. That's intentional. The uh, scene where, like, scan- like she tells Vex that she can't date him right now, and then she looks at Vex, and, like, the- it, like she doesn't look at Vex. The camera pans at Vex, and, like, that's just a cool show of effect of just, like, oh, she's looking at Vex. Yes, but also, a few seconds after Vex is done with her scene, she goes over to Keyleth and is like, hey, good job on getting your shit together, and Keyleth blushes. Okay, that's this true. This is the immediate context yeah. to each other. And the way that we've... Skipped over this when we discussed the um, fingering. Fingering. That if you if you didn't want Vex to be hit by the finger of death, Keyleth, as the one who killed Silas, would have been the perfectly fine target for uh, for this finger of death. Instead, yeah. Vex is targeted and Keyleth throws herself in front of her. Which I would be comfortable. Like the thing is that I'm not. It's not that I don't like it that that Keyleth canonically has a crush on Vex. I think that's fine. I think that it's it's a little bit disingenuous to. Set this up as like a viable option yeah. as something that might happen when you know yeah. for a fact that it won't. Yes. Keelan has a crush on Vex, it's not reciprocated, it's also just like kind of in the background. And honestly, I mean, Hardy has a crush on Vex. Who doesn't have a crush on Vex? Except for Vex, <laughs> but like, yeah. Not for lack of trying. <laughs> Sorry. That was a joke. Don't take that seriously. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, so it's 
seems really mean spirited to play this up with a certain knowledge that this isn't going to happen. Yeah, I agree. I think that like like it's not this isn't some just make sure that you're conscious of it in the future. Yeah, it's not traditionally queer baiting because both characters involved actually are queer. Just not with each other. They are. Just not with each other. It's it's weird, but I almost want them to move forward with this, not by having Keyleth not have a crush on Vex, but by having Keyleth have a crush on other other girls in addition to Vex. Does that make sense? Or just a whole bunch of other people. Or just a whole bunch of other people, but like have her like have it be less obvious that it's not like Vex and Keyleth are a viable option, but more obvious that like Keyleth is attracted to girls, or Keyleth is attracted to people of multiple genders. Mm-hmm. I think that there's a way of establishing that without reinforcing the 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 kind of the false hope that they might get together. Yes. Okay. Okay. Finally, our favorite topic: cannibalism. <laughs> We made it this far without a single cannibalism tangent. Yes, but I had to. What is our favorite topic? Vex. Vex. Her depiction, where it flounders, and also the presalia of it all. Hmm. I think the problem with Vex is often that it feels like she's uh, written by multiple authors, who some of which understand her, and some of which mm-hmm. don't understand her. Or Sam Regal. Or Sam Regal. And some of which are naturally, are actually very fond of her. And that seems to, like, you can even tell the difference between, like, the two times she slapped someone. Oh, God, we glossed over those, but yeah. Yeah, her slapping Scanlan just feels so mean-spirited. Like that bitch. Nah, eh, just like that bitch, that huh? Bitch. But, like, her slapping Especially with the weird kind of conflict that was set up between them. Yeah. Like, the conflict between Vex, between Vex and Scanlan in the beginning felt like, oh, yeah, they're acknowledging her as the leader. This is great. And then it just... She was just turned out to be so demeaning towards him, which is totally against what Vex is like in canon. Yeah, and also fits into the entire narrative, which we have an entire episode about, about the ways in which Keyleth and the ways in which Vex in canon gets like depicted as more mean than she is, despite the fact that she is, you know, the charismatic one. Yes, that was our first Patreon special of Vex and supplementary materials, where she is the mean twin and Vex is the nice twin. And Vex is just kind of a bitch, which mm. she is sometimes, yes, but for a reason, as Laura's monologue in the uh, Q&A to episodes 4 to 6. Yes. yes. I will say I enjoyed the focus she got in the beginning because of uh, her, well, her leadership qualities, but it did slip towards the middle part where she was just there to be a menace to Scanlan. I feel like they found, like, their, their true north, though, by the end. Like, by the time yes. they got to the Vex and percy of it all... Like, they got that. Like, they, they understood, like, oh, so it's like a competent writer got into the staff and was like, I know what Vex is. Possibly Laura Bailey? Laura Bailey? Ironically, mm-hmm. also Sam Regal. Sam Regal. Also wrote episode 12. Damn. Weird. I don't know. It's weird. I almost feel like we've said enough about this, but I, uh, how much of, like, I could talk about this for the rest of forever, right? Yeah, I will briefly say something about the Darling Take the Mask Off versus Darling Take Off the Mask. Yes is that these things are set in extremely different situations. Again, because someone's sequence broke the Cassandra stuff. Also, um, like, I feel like there's a, a physical mask versus um, non-literal mask, which I feel like Darling Take the Mask Off sort of hints towards a more metaphysical mask. Yes, and it's also in context of... Um, this conversation comes right off of the heels of um, Vex and Percy having a very honest talk about his mental state and how the demon is taking over and what to do when that happens and if he's in control, where she pinned him against the wall. And these moments of checking in and her caring for Percy have been sacrificed to Keyleth being the nice one and her being the bitchy one. Yeah, and that's really disappointing. It also, like, can't assert enough that, like, I don't know, I feel like there's something so wonderful about, like, the way that Vex is during this arc. And not necessarily just with Persalia, but also because, like, we're told and reinforced by over and over again this like narrative of tragedy where like Percy will lose control and someone will have to take him out. And like Yes. Time and again it feels like 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 Vex is actively going against to that narrative, right? That's just their entire love story. The yes. entire arc, the entire story. Percy is destined for tragedy and Vex is here to stop it. Yeah. Sort of. Yes. Well Vex is here to motivate him to stop it himself, but you know. Is there anything else you want to say about Vex? No. Oh. Well, do we have an opinion? Magical timing. <laughs> I mean, 
Thank you all for listening through this behemoth of an episode. Yeah, thank you. This Thank you for recording me for so long. I feel like we were actually very fair and balanced. I think so too. I think we were the fairest bitches in the world, but we started off very angrily. <laughs> yeah. Our opinion for this week is... If a door is this yonic, it is obviously the front door. Thank you very much for Current Sun for our song. Thank you to our patrons. And to Lafia for the Thank art. You to Lafia Thank for the you art. for everyone who, li- who listened to this giant episode. Four hour behemoth? Four hour 20 like, minute what behemoth. What the fuck were we even thinking? Yes. And <laughs> thank you to you, Yana, for staying until 8 p.m. my time and God knows when your time. 5 a.m. Christ. We haven't recorded. 5 a.m. Yeah, Kay, uh, Kay, long time listener of the show. Hi, hello, yes, you. Is getting here in um, five and a half hours. Go to sleep. 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 Sure. Okay. Thank you okay. for listening. Love you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Love you all. Bye.